In this video, we're going to focus on cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is the process by which we derive energy from food. In cellular respiration, we're going to take one molecule of glucose, which has the chemical formula C6H1206, and it's going to react with six molecules of oxygen to produce six molecules of carbon dioxide and six molecules of water. And this, this process is going to release energy. So it's exergonic. And it releases a lot of energy. So that's the reaction for cellular respiration. On the left side, we have the reactants. And on the right side, we have the products of the chemical reaction. Now, some of the energy released by cellular respiration or released by uh, the oxidation of glucose is lost as heat energy or thermal energy. Some of it is captured in the form of ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. ATP is the energy currency of the cell. It gives us the energy that we need to move, to grow, and to do all the things that we do in our everyday lives. It provides the energy to drive endergonic reactions. And a lot of times it does this by the transfer of a phosphate group. So when this energy is released, energy is stored by converting ADP, adenosine diphosphate, into adenosine triphosphate. So this reaction is endergonic. It takes energy to work. But to release energy from ATP is the reverse. Due to the unstable phosphate bonds, whenever ATP loses a phosphate group, it releases energy. And so that is an exergonic reaction. Exergonic reactions release energy. Endergonic reactions, they require energy. They absorb it in order to work. Now, here is a question for you. Why do cells need ATP in the first place? Why not use the energy released directly from glucose to drive endergonic reactions? The answer is efficiency. Glucose releases a large amount of energy, whereas the loss of a phosphate group from ATP only releases a small amount of energy. As a result, there's less energy loss in the form of heat. So thus, the process of transferring energy from ATP to a chemical reaction is more efficient. More energy is converted into useful work. And that's why cells use ATP instead of glucose, because it's more efficient to convert that energy into work. Let's use the internal combustion engine inside a car to illustrate this concept. Imagine taking all of the gasoline inside a car and reacting it with oxygen in a combustion reaction. Now that process will be very dangerous. You'll get one large explosion, but you won't be able to convert much of that energy into useful work. A lot of it will be wasted in the form of heat. But now, if you were to use that gasoline in a car, in a small car engine, instead of having one large explosion, you'll have a series of small, tiny explosions that drive the piston to cause the vehicle to move. As a result, because you have, you're releasing that energy a little at a time, it's more efficient. You're better able to convert that energy into useful work. And this is why cells tend to store their energy temporarily in the form of ATP, because that energy can be released in series of small steps in a much safer way, but also in a more efficient way. So releasing energy all at once is not an efficient process to perform useful work. But when you release energy a little at a time, the efficiency increases. Most small car engines tend to be more efficient than bigger, larger engines. Now, the next thing that I want to mention 
is the structure of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. ATP has three subunits, a five carbon ribose sugar, a nitrogenous base, the nitrogenous base is called adenine, and it has three phosphate groups. So that's a simplified structure of ATP. Now let's do an overview of cellular respiration. Cellular respiration can be broken down into four stages. The first stage is something called glycolysis. If we break down the word glycolysis, glyco refers to a carbohydrate. Lysis means to split apart. So in glycolysis, we're taking glucose and we're gonna split it into two molecules of pyruvate. In stage two, we have pyruvate oxidation. In this stage, pyruvate is oxidized into acetyl coenzyme A. In the third step, this is known as the Krebs cycle. In the Krebs cycle, acetyl coenzyme A is oxidized into carbon dioxide. The electrons released from that reaction is used to create NADH and FADH2. In step four, we have the electron transport chain, which the molecules NADH and FADH2 will give up those electrons, and those electrons will pass through the electron transport chain. In that process, ATP will be produced. By the way, glycolysis, you need to know that this occurs in the cytosol of the cell. Pyruvate oxidation, that occurs inside the mitochondria. The Krebs cycle also occurs inside the mitochondrial matrix. And the electron transport chain, that occurs in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Not the outer membrane, but the inner membrane. So you need to know where these processes occur in the cell. Let's begin our discussion with the first stage of cellular respiration, that is glycolysis. In glycolysis, glucose, a six carbon molecule, is converted into two pyruvate molecules, each with three carbon atoms. Pyruvate contains a methyl group, a carbonyl group, and a carboxylate group. Pyruvic acid has a hydrogen instead of an oxygen for negative charge. So this is pyruvic acid, but if you take away the hydrogen, it becomes pyruvate. Now in this process, two molecules of adenosine diphosphate is converted to two molecules of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. This is known as substrate level phosphorylation. Anytime you add a phosphate group to something, it's known as phosphorylation. In this video, there's two types of phosphorylation events that you need to be familiar with, substrate level phosphorylation and oxidative phosphorylation. So this is an example of substrate level phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation occurs at the beginning of the electron transport chain, which we'll talk about that later in this video. Now, something else happens. Two molecules of NAD plus is reduced to two molecules of NADH as glucose is converted into two pyruvate molecules. Now, we need to understand the terms oxidation and reduction. The conversion of glucose into pyruvate is an oxidation reaction. The conversion of NAD plus into NADH is a reduction reaction. So there's four ways in which you could describe an oxidation reaction. Number one, the oxidation state goes up. Number two, you have a loss of electrons. Number three, you have a gain 
of oxygen atoms, or number four, you have a loss of hydrogen atoms. You could use any one of these four ways to determine if you have an oxidation or a reduction reaction. In a reduction reaction, the reverse is true. The oxidation number or oxidation state will decrease. It's going to be reduced. Reduction is associated with a gain of electrons. It's also associated with a loss of oxygen atoms or a gain of hydrogen atoms. So let's use NAD+. So let's convert this into NADH. So there's two ways in which we could determine that this is indeed a reduction reaction. The first has to do with the oxidation state. This has a positive charge. So the oxidation state is plus one. This doesn't have any charge. The oxidation state is zero. Going from one to zero, the oxidation state decreased or it was reduced. So that's a reduction reaction. The second way is to look at uh, the fact that we have a gain of hydrogen. NAD plus, it has hydrogen atoms, but when we compare it to NADH, we could see that it gained one hydrogen atom. And so we could say that it's reduced. Here's the entire reaction. Here we have NAD plus. It reacts with a hydrogen ion and it accepts two electrons in order to convert to NADH. So here we have a third way to determine that it's reduction, the fact that it's gaining electrons. Whenever you see electrons on the left side of a chemical reaction, it's reduction. If the electrons are on the right side of the chemical reaction, it's oxidation. Now, glycolysis occurs in 10 steps. We're not gonna talk about each step in detail, but one thing I do wanna mention is that there's two important phases you need to know with glycolysis. The first half, or the first five reactions, refers to the investment phase. In the investment phase, you need to invest ATP molecules to get glycolysis started. So you're gonna lose two ATP molecules in this phase. During the second half of glycolysis, that is the last five reactions, this is known as the payoff phase. And in this phase, you're gonna get four ATP molecules per one molecule of glucose. So glycolysis has a net gain of two ATP molecules per glucose molecule. So you need to be familiar with this number. So glycolysis will yield a net of two ATP molecules. So here is an overview of glycolysis. You could see that it occurs in 10 reactions. And notice the amount of ATP that's produced and the amount that's consumed. So in step one and step three, ATP is converted into ADP. So that is the investment phase. You're putting in two molecules of ATP to get glycolysis started. And notice that in the payoff phase, you get a total of four ATP molecules. So you put in two, you got back four. There's a net gain of two ATP molecules. In step six, we could see that we gained two molecules of NADH. Keep in mind, glucose splits off into two molecules of pyruvate. So on the left side, you have one molecule of pyruvate, and on the right side, another molecule of pyruvate. Now, the next thing I want to mention are the enzymes. The first type of enzyme is a kinase enzyme. A kinase enzyme is typically associated with the transfer of a phosphate group. They catalyze the transfer of a phosphate group. So here we have hexokinase. The phosphate group is leaving from ATP. In step three, we have another loss of a phosphate group from ATP and the enzyme is phosphofructokinase. Step seven, we have substrate level phosphorylation and another kinase enzyme. And the same is true for 10. So anytime there's a transfer of a phosphate group, the enzyme that catalyzes such a transfer is a kinase enzyme.
If you see the word isomerase, then that tells you that this enzyme, it catalyzes a rearrangement reaction. Glucose 6-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate, they're isomers of each other. They have the same chemical formula. They simply have been rearranged. So this type of enzyme, it transfers a rear, I mean, it catalyzes a rearrangement reaction. So I just want to mention those details um, just in case you had questions on it. And then there's another enzyme that you need to be familiar with. That is a dehydrogenase enzyme. A dehydrogenase enzyme removes hydrogen from a substrate. So prior to this, we had glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, G3P. And notice the amount of hydrogen atoms in this molecule. So we have 1, 2, 3, 5. Now looking at the product, 1,3-biphosphoglycerate, notice that there's only 4 hydrogen atoms. So one hydrogen atom was transferred to NAD+, making NADH. And that hydrogen atom was taken from G3P to give it to NADH. So going from G3P to BPG, we lost the hydrogen. And we can see that NAD+, it took that hydrogen. So dehydrogenase is an enzyme that removes hydrogen. Kinase is an enzyme that helps with the transfer of a phosphate group and isomerase is an enzyme that catalyzes rearrangement reactions. Now let's move on to stage two of cellular respiration and that is pyruvate oxidation. So as mentioned before, pyruvate will be converted into acetyl coenzyme A which looks like this. It contains a sulfur and the, co -A, the coenzyme A part. So this is pyruvate on the left. So what's happening in this reaction? Let's talk about that. Notice that we lost a carboxylic acid molecule. So therefore, this is a decarboxylation reaction. A decarboxylation reaction is an oxidation reaction. Notice that we lost oxygen atoms. Whenever there's an oxidation reaction, there is always a reduction reaction. If something lost electrons, something else had to gain those electrons. And the first electron carrier that we have in cellular respiration is NAD+. NAD+, is going to pick up those electrons along with a hydrogen ion to produce NADH. So that is the corresponding reduction reaction. Now the reaction that catalyzes, I mean the enzyme rather, the enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of pyruvate into acetyl coenzyme A, this is known as pyruvate dehydrogenase. Whenever you see this enzyme, there's always a transfer of hydrogen somewhere. In this case, NAD plus is the hydrogen acceptor. As it accepts the hydrogen, it turns into NADH. But this leaves a question. Where did the hydrogen come from? Because pyruvate has three hydrogen atoms, and acetyl coenzyme A also has three hydrogen atoms. The answer lies in the product. Notice the group that we added. The reactant looks like this. It's coenzyme A with a thio group attached to it. So this is the hydrogen that goes into the solution and is later picked up by NAD+. So anytime you see a, dehydro, excuse me, a dehydrogenase enzyme, there's always a transfer of hydrogen somewhere, either from the reactant, from the solution. There's always a transfer of a hydrogen atom. Something will lose the hydrogen atom, while something else will gain that hydrogen atom. Now let's move on to step three of 
cellular respiration, and that is the Krebs cycle. So prior to that, we had the oxidation of pyruvate. We saw pyruvate being oxidized into acetyl coenzyme A. The acetyl part is a two carbon molecule. And as we produce acetyl coenzyme A, we lost CO2 in a decarboxylation reaction, which is an oxidation reaction. And we also had a reduction reaction as NAD plus was converted to NADH. So now acetyl coenzyme A enters into the Krebs cycle, which occurs in the mitochondrial matrix. Now this two carbon acetyl group is combined with oxaloacetate, which has four carbons and it produces citric acid. In this case, citrate. Citric acid would have the hydrogen atoms on the carboxylate groups. Citrate, it doesn't have those hydrogen atoms. It's just COO minus. Notice that we regenerate the coenzyme A molecule with the SH diol group, as you can see here. Now we're not gonna go over all of the individual reactions of the Krebs cycle. You can review that when you get a chance. But the gist of it is this. The two carbon molecule, the acetyl group, will be oxidized into two molecules of carbon dioxide. Here is the first one, here is the second one. And then we're going to regenerate oxaloacetate and that's going to pick up another acetyl coenzyme A. So this is a cycle, it repeats itself. And this coenzyme A is going to react again with pyruvate, repeating the process. Now, I do want to talk about the enzymes in this reaction. The first one is the dehydrogenase enzyme. As I mentioned before earlier, this is used to catalyze the removal of hydrogen atoms from a molecule or a substrate and then transfer it to like NAD plus or FADH. So here, the hydrogen was transferred to NAD plus. And going from isocitrate to alpha ketoglutarate, we could see that we lost some hydrogen atoms. This molecule here has five hydrogen atoms, and this one here has four, so it lost the hydrogen. And in step five, we have another dehydrogenase enzyme, and we can see that NAD plus is picking up a hydrogen, turning to NADH. And the same is true for seven and nine. There's a transfer of a hydrogen atom somewhere. In step seven, FAD is converted to FADH2. We can see that sustenate lost two hydrogens as it was converted to fumarate. And then going from malate to oxaloacetate, there's another loss of two hydrogen atoms. This had four, this had two. And so another dehydrogenase enzyme was used for that. So anytime you see a dehydrogenase enzyme, you know that it catalyzes the removal of hydrogen atoms and transfer it from one molecule to another. Now let's not lose sight of the purpose of the Krebs cycle, which is to oxidize the two carbon acetyl group into two molecules of carbon dioxide. Keep in mind, oxidation involves a loss of electrons. Those electrons are going to be picked up by NAD plus and FAD. NAD plus is the first electron carrier, FAD is the second one. And those electron carriers will then release their electrons in the electron transport chain, which we'll talk about later. But for now, know that one turn of the Krebs cycle produces three molecules of NADH, one, two, three, one molecule of FADH2, and it produces one molecule of GTP. But notice that as GDP gains a phosphate and becomes GTP from step six, GTP will lose that phosphate, regenerating GDP, but converting ADP to ATP. So one turn of the Krebs cycle produces three molecules of NADH, one molecule of FADH2, and a net of one molecule of ATP. GTP and GDP, they're going to in a cycle, so there's really no net gain there. Now, keep in mind that glucose generates two molecules of pyruvate, and thus two molecules of acetyl coenzyme A. 
So one molecule of glucose equates to two turns of the Krebs cycle. So one molecule of glucose yields six NADH molecules, two FADH2 molecules, and two ATP molecules. You may want to write that down. One thing I do want to mention is that in this video, sometimes I referred to these particles as molecules. Technically, they're ions because they carry a charge. But in, in biology or biochemistry, sometimes you'll see people refer to these as molecules. But they're really ions. This would be a molecule. It doesn't have a net charge. CO2 is a molecule. But citrate, isocitrate, pyruvate, those are ions because they carry a net charge. Just want to mention that. So if I refer to this as a molecule, let's say a molecule of pyruvate, it's really an ion if it has a charge. Now, before we finish our discussion with the Krebs cycle, there is one more thing I need to talk about, and that is FAD. FAD is actually part of the inner membrane of the mitochondria. It's not in the mitochondrial matrix. It's stuck on the membrane. And succinate dehydrogenase, it's an enzyme that is in the membrane where FAD and FADH2 will be located. So even though the Krebs cycle occurs in the mitochondrial matrix, this enzyme is actually in the inner membrane. So FAD and FADH2, it doesn't leave the membrane. It's there. So that's one thing I do want to mention, and we're going to talk about that more in the, the electron transport chain. Now, let's briefly talk about the mitochondria and what you need to know about it with regard to cellular respiration. In red, this is the outer membrane of the mitochondria. The line represented in blue is the inner membrane of the mitochondria. The space between is known as the intermembrane space. And then on the inside, this is the mitochondrial matrix. Now keep in mind the Krebs cycle occurs in the mitochondrial matrix. The electron transport chain occurs in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So those are some things that you want to keep in mind as well. Now let's move on to stage four of cellular respiration, and that is the electron transport chain. Now the NADH molecule that we generated in the Krebs cycle and even in glycolysis, as well as pyruvate oxidation, it's going to give up a hydrogen and some electrons at complex one. Complex one is called NADH dehydrogenase. As all dehydrogenase enzymes go, it's going to catalyze the removal of hydrogen from NADH. As a result, NADH will lose electrons. It's going to give up electrons to complex one. Those electrons will travel to ubiquinone, represented by the symbol Q. Ubiquinone is a mobile electron carrier. It actually moves to complex one, picks up the electrons, and then take it to complex three. Keep in mind, the electrons have a negative charge. And on their own, they can't move by themselves along the inner membrane because the membrane is made up of phospholipids and the tails of the phospholipids are nonpolar. And so they don't interact well with negatively charged electrons. So the electrons has to be carried by a mobile electron carrier, in this case, ubiquinone. Now ubiquinone is going to pass on the electrons to complex three. Complex three is called cytochrome reductase, also known as BC1 complex by some textbooks. Cytochrome C, I mean cytochrome three rather, is going to give the electrons to cytochrome C. Whenever cytochrome C receives electrons, it becomes reduced. Reduction, as we talked about, is the gain of electrons. And so this name is fitting for complex three because it reduces cytochrome C by giving it electrons. 
Cytochrome C is another mobile electron carrier. It's free to move, but it's a surface protein as opposed to an integral protein. Complex 1 and 3, these are transmembrane proteins, also integral proteins because they're completely embedded within the membrane. Now C, cytochrome C is going to give up the electrons to complex 4, also known as cytochrome oxidase. This particular transmembrane protein, it oxidizes cytochrome C because it takes away electrons from it. Anytime you have a loss of electrons, oxidation occurs. Now the electrons will flow out of complex 4, where they're going to meet up with oxygen and some hydrogen ions to form water, which is one of the products of cellular respiration. Now, the other electron carrier that we need to talk about is FADH2. Now, I mentioned this earlier, FAD and FADH2, they are bound to the inner membrane. They're part of complex 2. So I'm going to write F to represent FAD, and then FH2 to represent FADH2. Let me get rid of this for now. Now, in step 7 of the Krebs cycle, we saw that sustenate converts into fumarate. And as a result, it gives up electrons and hydrogen as well, converting FAD into FADH2. So that's in the Krebs cycle. Sustenate dehydrogenase complex 2 is the enzyme that removes hydrogens from sustenate, converting that into fumarate, and then those hydrogen atoms are transferred to FAD. Now, in the electron transport chain, FADH2 gives up those hydrogens and the electrons, turning back into FAD. So it's a cyclic process. So as FADH2 turns to FAD, the electrons will be picked up by ubiquinone, and then it's going to be carried to complex 3, and then to cytochrome, and to complex 4. Now, as the electrons are transferred through these membrane proteins across the electron transport chain, protons are pumped from the mitochondrial matrix into the intermembrane space. And so each of these transmembrane proteins are pumping out protons into the intermembrane space. And so what happens is we have a buildup of positive charge in the intermembrane space. So the pH here is going to be relatively low. Now, as these protons are pumped into this region, the intermembrane space is going to develop a positive charge. And so the mitochondrial matrix will be less positive or more negative with respect to the intermembrane space. And so there's going to be an electric force that these protons will fill because they're going to be attracted to the negatively charged mitochondrial matrix. The second thing is a concentration gradient. You have a large concentration of protons in the intermembrane space. So the electric force combined with this concentration gradient will cause these protons to enter this enzyme, ATP synthase, which you can also say it's a, a membrane protein, it's going to cause the protons to flow through ATP synthase. And they're going to cause this portion to basically turn like a rotor. A good way to think about this is water flowing down into a turbine, causing the turbine to spin. So as these protons flow down this membrane, they will cause this, they will create a mechanical force that will smash ADP and phosphate to make ATP. 
So this process is known as chemiosmosis because we're using diffusion to create ATP. So the electron transport chain is basically what we see here. The electrons traveling from complex one all the way to complex four. Chemiosmosis is the production of ATP using the diffusion of protons as it flows through ATP synthase. When you combine the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis, you have oxidative phosphorylation. Now keep in mind, phosphorylation occurs when we transfer a phosphate group to something. In this case, transferring a phosphate group to ADP to make ATP, that is an example of phosphorylation. Now, in the electron transport chain, NADH is oxidized to NAD+. It's oxidized in a sense that NADH loses electrons to the electron transport chain, and you can see its oxidation state increases from 0 to plus 1. So both NADH and FADH2 are oxidized in the electron transport chain. And using ATP synthase, ADP is phosphorylated with a phosphate group making ATP. So combined, we have oxidative phosphorylation. The first part is oxidation, the second part, phosphorylation. Now, one more thing that I do want to mention is that there are many electron acceptors. In glycolysis, we saw that NAD plus was an electron acceptor. It took electrons as glucose split into pyruvate. FAD served as an electron acceptor when succinate was converted to fumarate. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor in this process. Oxygen is one of the most electronegative elements besides fluorine. And so because of that affinity for electrons, oxygen basically pulls electrons through the electron transport chain to itself. And so that's really the driving force here. It's electronegativity. Because electrons will travel from atoms that are less electronegative to atoms that are very electronegative. So in the beginning, the electrons were located in glucose. So they were attached to carbon atoms. And then in the end, those electrons go to oxygen to make water and carbon dioxide. So as the electrons flow from carbon to oxygen, energy is released. Carbon is not very electronegative. Its electronegativity is like 2.5. For oxygen, it's 3.5. So as we take electrons from an atom that is less electronegative to an atom that is more electronegative, we can extract energy from that process. A good way to illustrate this is the use of a battery. So let's say I'm going to draw a AA battery. Here is the positive terminal, and here is the negative terminal. And let's connect this to a light bulb. Let's say this battery is strong enough to light up the light bulb. Electrons will flow from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. And in a process from moving from one side to the other side, energy can be extracted from it. And in this case, lighting up the light bulb. So the positive terminal would be the electronegative side of the battery because it pulls the electrons toward it. The negative terminal will be the part that's less electronegative because that's where the electrons are coming from. In this case, carbon would be like the negative terminal of the battery. Oxygen will be like the positive terminal of the battery because oxygen being electronegative pulls the electrons away from carbon. And so anytime electrons flow from one position to another position, energy can be extracted as those electrons move from one location to the other, as we could see in the case of a battery. The same is true for, let's say we have a ball rolling down the hill. At the top, the ball has potential energy, but as it moves from one position to another position, that potential energy is converted to kinetic energy. And in that motion, 
energy can be extracted. If you think of water flowing down a hill, that water could be used to move the turbine, which can then be used to create electricity. So whenever you have an object or a particle like an electron moving from one location to another, energy can be extracted uh, during that process, which is what we see here in the electron transport chain. So the electrons, they travel from carbon to NAD+, and then from NAD+, they go to complex 1, and then to Q, and then complex 3, and then complex 4, and then finally to oxygen. So oxygen has the greatest electronegativity or electron affinity for electrons. So here's a question for you. Which complex has a greater electron affinity for electrons? Would you say complex 1 or complex 3? So according to the sequence, because complex 3 comes after complex 1, we could say that complex 3 has a greater electron affinity, or rather a greater affinity for electrons than complex 1. So we could say that complex 3 is more electronegative than complex 1. Now, in the case of FAD, carbon gives its electrons to FAD, and then FAD gives its electrons to complex 2, which gives its electrons to Q. So if we were to compare the mobile carrier ubiquinone in complex 2, we would say that complex Q is more electronegative than complex 2 because it comes after complex 2. The electrons will always flow from something that is less electronegative to something that is more electronegative spontaneously. The only way to make the electrons go back is by putting energy into the system. But as electrons flow this way, energy is released. So now we need to do some math. So let's go back to NADH. As NADH is oxidized to NAD+, we said that it's going to give up electrons, which will pass through complex 1, Q, complex 3, and complex 4. So notice that NADH activates three complexes. And these three complexes will be shooting out protons into the intermembrane space. It turns out that NADH, one molecule of NADH, will yield three ATP molecules. And this is proportional to the number of complexes that NADH activates. Now, as FADH2 turns into FAD, which is basically inside this complex, even though I drew it outside, it only activates two of the three complex proteins. It activates these two. And it turns out that one FADH2 molecule produces two ATP molecules, which makes sense. The proportions have to be the same. So keep that in mind, because we're going to talk about the net amount of ATP that one molecule of glucose can yield in cellular respiration. So let's begin with the first stage of cellular respiration, which is glycolysis, converting glucose into pyruvate. In glycolysis, we generated a net amount of two ATP molecules. In addition, we generated two NADH molecules. Now keep in mind, one NADH molecule activates three proton pumps in the electron transport chain. So we could say that one NADH molecule will generate three ATP molecules. So if two of them should generate six ATP molecules. Now some textbooks will say that in order for NADH to, the NADH that's producing glycolysis to travel to the mitochondria, keep in mind glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm. So to move NADH from the cytoplasm into the mitochondrion cell, it requires one ATP molecule. 
So to transport two NADH molecules into the mitochondria, it's going to cost us two ATP molecules, giving us a net yield of four ATP molecules. Now, in step two, pyruvate oxidation, two molecules of NADH are produced, which yields six ATP molecules. In step three, the Krebs cycle, we get one ATP molecule per turn of the cycle but one glucose molecule yields two pyruvate molecules, which corresponds to two acetylcoenzyme A molecules. And so that's two turns in the Krebs cycle. So we get two ATP molecules from one glucose molecule. Now, instead of getting three NADH molecules per turn, we're gonna get six NADH molecules. If we multiply that by three, that's 18 ATP molecules. One turn of the Krebs cycle gives us one FADH2 molecule. So for two turns, that's two FADH2 molecules. And keep in mind, each FADH2 molecule activates two of the three proton pumps. So we're going to say that one FADH2 molecule yields two ATP molecules. So two FADH2 molecules yields four ATP molecules. So if we add up these numbers, 2 plus 18, that's 20, 24, 30, 36, 38. So one glucose molecule can yield a maximum of 38 ATP molecules. Now, if you subtract the two ATP molecules that are needed to transport the two NADH molecules from the cytosol into the mitochondria, then we get a net value of 36 ATP. Now, this is basically an ideal scenario. Natural systems are not 100% efficient, so the true number might be less than 36 or 38. Some of the protons in the intermembrane space can leak through back into the mitochondrial matrix even without going through ATP synthase. This is what some textbooks suggest. So if that happens, the yield won't be as high as 36 or 38, it will be less. So this is an ideal scenario where we can get a maximum of 38 ATP if everything works out perfectly. Cellular respiration is a type of aerobic respiration. The word aerobic means with oxygen. So in cellular respiration, we saw that glucose was converted to pyruvate during glycolysis. And in step two, pyruvate oxidation, pyruvate was converted to acetyl coenzyme A. And during the Krebs cycle, acetyl coenzyme A was oxidized into two molecules of carbon dioxide. And during the electron transport chain, the electrons that were carried by NADH and FADH2, they were transferred to oxygen, which in the presence of hydrogen ions, turned into water. So this is what happens in the presence of oxygen. Glucose is ultimately converted into carbon dioxide and water with the help of oxygen. Now, what happens when oxygen is not present? So what happens under anaerobic conditions, that is, without oxygen? In this case, we're going to get something called fermentation. Now, it's important to understand that glycolysis does not need oxygen to work. In fact, glucose can be converted to pyruvate without the help of oxygen. So let's say if you're exercising and your oxygen is low. Let's say if you're undergoing, like you're working out or 
if you're running at your maximum pace. When your muscle cells run out of oxygen, they can do something called lactic acid fermentation. So glucose will be converted to pyruvate. And as that happens, glycolysis will generate two ATP molecules. So your muscles will be using these ATP molecules for energy. In addition, NAD plus is converted into NADH. Now here is the problem. In order for glycolysis to continue, you need to regenerate NAD plus because if your cells run out of NAD plus, glycolysis can continue and your cells won't be able to make ATP. So this is why fermentation is important. Pyruvate, for some reason I drew acetate. So this is pyruvate. In lactic acid fermentation, pyruvate is going to change into lactate, which looks like this. The carbonyl group has been reduced to an alcohol group. So that's the difference between pyruvate and lactate. Now NADH is going to be the substance that reduces this carbonyl group to a hydroxyl group. So NADH has to be oxidized to NAD+. And so this is how we can regenerate NAD+, thus allowing glycolysis to continue. So that is lactic acid fermentation. This is what your muscle cells do when they're running out of oxygen. That's how they can make ATP to give you the energy that you need. But as the lactic acid content in your muscles increases during heavy exercise, you're going to feel that, that tiredness, that soreness, that pain sensation. But as you take a break, as you continue to breathe in oxygen, your body will convert lactate back into pyruvate, and then pyruvate ultimately into carbon dioxide and water. So in the presence of oxygen, your cells can generate a lot of ATP. In the absence of oxygen, it turns to lactic acid fermentation, generating ATP in a very short time frame. Now let's talk about the other type of anaerobic respiration, and that is ethanol fermentation. So in ethanol fermentation, this is this happens with yeast cells. These are single celled fungi. Glucose is converted to pyruvate. So glycolysis still occurs. And as before, NAD plus is reduced to NADH. And we're still going to get our two ATP molecules. Now the next step of ethanol fermentation, that is after glycolysis, pyruvate undergoes decarboxylation. It converts into a molecule called acetaldehyde. As you can see, it went from a three carbon molecule, or rather a three carbon ion, to a two carbon molecule. So we lost CO2. So that's a decarboxylation step. And then acetaldehyde is reduced to ethanol using a reducing agent, NADH. As NADH gives up its electrons to, and let me say that again, as NADH gives up its electrons, it is oxidized to NAD+, thus reducing acetaldehyde into ethanol. So now that we've regenerated NAD+, it can go back into the cycle, allowing glycolysis to continue, producing more ATP molecules. And so that's what yeast cells do 
when oxygen is not present. So if you were to mix the yeast cells with glucose in the absence of oxygen, they're going to make ethanol. They convert glucose into ethanol. Now, the carbon dioxide that they emit from this step, the decarboxylation step, is the reason why bread rises in the presence of yeast. The CO2 is the gas that expands the bread. So that's ethanol fermentation. Now, for those of you who might be studying for a test on cellular respiration, here are some practice problems that might be helpful to you. So let's start with this one. Number one, which of the following is a product of cellular respiration? Would you say NADH, oxygen gas, glucose, carbon dioxide, or FADH2? Well, let's begin with the net reaction of cellular respiration. So we have glucose, C6H12O6. It reacts with six oxygen molecules to produce six carbon dioxide molecules, six water molecules, and energy. Glucose is a reactant, not a product. Keep in mind, the reactants are on the left side. The products are on the right side. Oxygen is a reactant. Now, in cellular respiration, NADH is produced in the Krebs cycle, in glycolysis, but it's consumed in the electron transport chain. So therefore, this is really an intermediate, not a product, because we make it and then we consume it. Carbon dioxide is a product. FADH2 is another intermediate like NADH. So it's not an overall product in this reaction. The answer is D. Number two, which of the following does not occur in cellular respiration? Feel free to pause the video if you want to try this yourself and then play the video when you have your answer. So the first step of cellular respiration, as we know, is glycolysis. That's stage one. Step two is pyruvate oxidation. Step three is the Krebs cycle. And step four is the electron transport chain. So we're looking for what does not occur in cellular respiration. Glycolysis occurs in cellular respiration, and the electron transport chain is part of it. Pyruvate oxidation also occurs in it. Now, the Krebs cycle is the same as the citric acid cycle. That's just another name for it. So we can eliminate answer choice B. Ethanol fermentation does not occur in traditional cellular respiration. Ethanol fermentation is outside of that. So D is the answer. Number three, which of the following is not a product of glycolysis? So glycolysis is a process that converts glucose into pyruvate, into two ions of pyruvate. And at the same time, it converts NAD plus into NADH and it converts ADP, two molecules of ADP, to two molecules of ATP in substrate level phosphorylation. So pyruvate is a product. We could eliminate answer choice A. ATP is also a product. You could think of it as a side product. It produces NADH, but it does not produce lactic acid, not in this step. Number four. How many ATP molecules are produced during glycolysis? In glycolysis, as we saw in the last problem, two ATP molecules are produced. It's not going to be 10, 32, 36, or 38. It's two. So answer choice A is the correct answer. Number five. Which of the following statements is false? Let's look at each one. So starting with answer choice A, glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm. Is that true or false? This is a true statement. So it's not the answer because we're looking for the statement that is false. 
B. Lactic acid fermentation occurs in muscle cells under anaerobic conditions. Is that true or false? Anaerobic conditions is conditions without oxygen. And lactic acid fermentation will occur in muscle cells if you're using your muscles and the oxygen content is very, very low. So this is true. C. Ethanol fermentation occurs when yeast cells consume glucose under aerobic conditions. Now, yeast cells do undergo ethanol fermentation in the presence of glucose, but not under aerobic conditions, under anaerobic conditions. So, ethanol fermentation occurs when yeast cells do not have the oxygen they need to complete the traditional cellular respiration. So, this is false because of the word aerobic. It has to be anaerobic. So, C is the answer. For D, the TCA cycle occurs in the mitochondrial matrix. That's true. Keep in mind, the TCA cycle, the tricarboxylic acid cycle, is the same as the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. And E, the mitochondria, is responsible for producing most of the ATP molecules in a cell. Keep in mind, the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, all of that happens inside of the mitochondria. So E is a true statement. 36 out of the 38 maximum ATP molecules that we can get occurs in the mitochondria. The other two is from glycolysis, which occurs in the cytoplasm. So the, the majority of the ATP molecules produced comes from the mitochondria. Number six, which of the following statements is true? Let's look at A. Aerobic cellular respiration yields a maximum of 34 ATP molecules. Is that true or false? That is a false statement. Traditional or aerobic cellular respiration yields a maximum of 38 ATP molecules. And if you take into account the two ATP molecules that are needed to transport NADH from the cytoplasm into the mitochondrial matrix, then that would, that would yield a net of 36 ATP. B, substrate level phosphorylation occurs during the electron transport chain. Is that true or false? That is a false statement. Substrate level phosphorylation first occurs in glycolysis. So when glucose splits into two molecules of pyruvate, ADP, two molecules of ADP, is phosphorylated into two molecules of ATP. And so that is an example of substrate level phosphorylation. C, oxidative phosphorylation occurs in glycolysis. That is false. Oxidative phosphorylation begins during the electron transport chain and ends with chemiosmosis when ATP is produced. D, anaerobic cellular respiration yields a maximum of two ATP molecules. Now that is a true statement. Under anaerobic conditions, that is without oxygen, fermentation occurs. So we have ethanol fermentation and lactic acid fermentation. The first step of ethanol fermentation is glycolysis. And then after glycolysis, once pyruvate is produced, pyruvate undergoes decarboxylation to produce acetaldehyde. And then acetaldehyde is reduced by NADH into ethanol. Now glycolysis yields two ATP molecules, but as pyruvate converts to acetaldehyde and into ethanol, it doesn't produce any ATP molecules in those steps. Now for lactic acid fermentation, glycolysis is the first step once again, and it generates two ATP molecules. 
the pyruvate ion produced during glycolysis is reduced into lactate using NADH. But no ATP molecules are produced in that step. So for both ethanol fermentation and lactic acid fermentation, only two ATP molecules are produced due to glycolysis. So that's why D is true. Anaerobic cellular respiration yields a maximum of two ATP molecules because of glycolysis. Now E is going to be a false statement. Muscle cells produce ethanol under anaerobic conditions. Muscle cells produce lactate under anaerobic conditions. Yeast cells, they will produce ethanol under anaerobic conditions. So that's it for number six. So the correct answer, which I kind of scratched off, the correct answer is answer choice D. Number seven, which of the following is not a product of pyruvate oxidation? So during pyruvate oxidation, pyruvate is converted to acetyl coenzyme A. Now I'm going to draw the structure. So this is pyruvate. And here is acetyl coenzyme A. So notice that we went from three carbons to two carbons. This indicates decarboxylation. So we lose CO2, which means carbon dioxide is a product of pyruvate oxidation. So we can eliminate answer choice C. Acetyl coenzyme A is a product of pyruvate oxidation, so that's gone. Now, in order for pyruvate to be oxidized to acetyl coenzyme A, something has to be reduced. And we know that something is NAD+. So NAD+, is converted to NADH. So NADH is another product of this process. So the fact that it says circle each one tells us that more than one answer could be correct. Under pyruvate oxidation, we don't get lactate, nor do we get ethanol. Number eight, which of the following statements is false? Starting with A, ATP synthase is the enzyme responsible for producing ATP during oxidative phosphorylation. Is that true or false? This is a true statement. Oxidative phosphorylation combines the activity of the electron transport chain and the production of ATP using the enzyme ATP synthase during chemiosmosis. So A is a true statement. B, NADH transfers its electrons to complex one. This is true. Early in the video, I had complex one here, and then NADH oxidizes into NAD plus given off its electrons. Oxidation always accompanies a loss of electrons. So B is a true statement. FADH2 transfers its electrons to complex two. Keep in mind, FADH2 is part of complex two. And so it transfers its electrons to it, which then goes to coenzyme Q. Now D, ubiquinone or coenzyme Q is a mobile electron carrier transferring electrons from complexes one and two to complex three. That's true. So here would be Q. This would be the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And then this would be complex three. And here's complex two. So Q would transfer electrons from one to three and from two to three. So that's the true statement. Now for E, NADH activates complex one pumping protons across the inner membrane into the mitochondrial matrix. NADH does indeed activate complex one and it does pump protons across the inner membrane, which is right here. That's the inner membrane of 
the mitochondria. What it doesn't do is pump it into the mitochondrial matrix. Complex 1 takes protons from the mitochondrial matrix and then it pumps it to the intermembrane space. So that's the problem with E. It doesn't pump it into the mitochondrial matrix. It pumps it into the intermembrane space where you have a lot of positively charged hydrogen ions. So E is the false statement, which is the answer we're looking for. Number nine, which of the following does not occur during pyruvate oxidation? So let's write down what we know. So here we have pyruvate, and during oxidation, it converts into acetoquenzyme A. Now, decarboxylation does occur. So A is true. Now what about B? NAD plus is reduced to NADH. That is also true. As we can see, the oxidation state goes from positive 1 to 0. So the oxidation state decreases, which means that it's reduced. And it also means that NAD plus received electrons to become NADH. So this is the true statement. And C, NADH is oxidized into NAD+. The only way that could be true is if NADH go back to NAD+. But that doesn't happen. So C is the false statement, which is the answer. CO2 is produced as a product. So D is true. And pyruvate loses electrons to NAD+, because NAD+, is reduced which means it gained electrons. So E is true. So only C is false. NAD plus is reduced to NADH. In this step, it doesn't go from NADH to NAD plus. So that's why C is false. Number 10, which of the following is the final electron acceptor in aerobic cellular respiration? Would you say it's NAD plus, complex four, O2, FAD, or ATP. ATP is not an electron acceptor. It simply gives away or transfers a phosphate group. The other four are electron acceptors, but the last one is oxygen. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor. It's also the strongest of the group. At the end of the electron transport chain, Oxygen with hydrogen ions picks up the electrons to form water. So this is the final electron acceptor, which creates the final product of cellular respiration, or one of the final products, which is H2O. So the correct answer is answer choice C. Number 11. Which of the following statements is not true? Let's look at the first one. ATP is the energy currency of the cell driving endergonic reactions. Is that true or false? This is a true statement. ATP is definitely the energy currency of the cell. All cells use ATP to power endergonic reactions. Now B, ATP transfers energy to other molecules in coupling reactions by the transfer of a phosphate group. That is also a true statement. And C, ATP consists of a nitrogenous base, a ribose sugar, and three phosphate groups. That's true. Here is the ribose sugar. This is the nitrogenous base. And then here are the three phosphate groups of ATP. So C is a true statement. What about D? The nitrogenous base of ATP is called adenosine. Now that is false. Now you have to be careful of this because ATP is called adenosine triphosphate. The base 
is adenine. The adenosine part of ATP is the combination of the nitrogenous base plus the ribose sugar. So that is called adenosine. So make sure you see the difference between the nitrogenous base adenine and adenosine, which is the nitrogenous base plus the ribose sugar. E has to be a true statement. ATP is produced from ADP by substrate level phosphorylation and oxidative phosphorylation. So that's true. We've seen ATP produced in glycolysis. So that's an example of substrate level phosphorylation. And even in the Krebs cycle, which is another example of substrate level phosphorylation. Now, oxidative phosphorylation occurs during the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. But the ATP part is produced in the chemiosmosis part of oxidative phosphorylation. So keep in mind, oxidative phosphorylation combines the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis when ATP is produced from the enzyme ATP synthase. Number 12, which of the following produces the greatest number of NADH molecules during aerobic cellular respiration? Is it glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, or oxidative phosphorylation? What would you say? In, glyco excuse me, in glycolysis, two NADH molecules are produced. In pyruvate oxidation, two NADH molecules are also produced. But in the Krebs cycle, six NADH molecules are produced. The electron transport chain doesn't produce NADH molecules. In fact, it consumes it. NADH gives its electrons to the electron transport chain, turning into NAD+. So in that case, the electron transport chain doesn't make any NADH molecules. Oxidative phosphorylation combines the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. During chemiosmosis, ATP is produced by the enzyme ATP synthase. And so during oxidative phosphorylation, no NADH molecules are produced. So the correct answer for this problem is answer choice C. During the Krebs cycle, we get the greatest number of NADH molecules. Number 13, which of the following electron acceptors has the lowest affinity for electrons? Now, keep in mind, electrons will flow from an atom that has a low affinity for it to an atom that has a high affinity for it. So oxygen being more electronegative than carbon it has a, an EN value of 3.5. The electronegativity for carbon is 2.5. So electrons will flow from carbon to oxygen because oxygen is more electronegative. It has a higher affinity for it. Now, if we follow the electrons throughout the electron transport chain, even starting from glucose, the electrons, they start from a carbon atom in glucose, and then NAD plus picks up those electrons, and then those electrons are transferred to complex one, and then to the mobile electron carrier, ubiquinone, or coenzyme Q, and then it goes to complex three, and then it gets transferred to cytochrome C, and then to complex four, and then finally to oxygen. So that will be the end of the electron transport chain. So oxygen has the highest affinity for electrons and carbon has the lowest affinity. So we're looking for the one with the lowest affinity. It's not going to be oxygen. 
We have complex three listed as one of our answer choices. We have cytochrome C, NAD plus, and ubiquinone. So out of the four that is highlighted, the closest one to the left is NAD plus. So NAD plus is the, the weakest electron acceptor out of the list that we have here. So C is the correct answer. Number 14, which of the following enzymes is typically used to transfer a phosphate group? Would you say it's the kinase enzyme, dehydrogenase, isomerase, ATP synthase, or enolase? The kinase enzyme is the answer. This is the one that is typically used to transfer a phosphate group. So A is the correct answer. Dehydrogenase is an enzyme that removes hydrogen from a molecule and transfers it somewhere else, but typically removes it. So that's not the answer we're looking for. Isomerase is an enzyme that catalyzes a rearrangement reaction, the keyword isomer. It turns one molecule into an isomer of itself, which is basically a rearrangement reaction. D, ATP synthase, if you think of the word synthase, synthesis, an ACE tells us that we're dealing with an enzyme. So this is an enzyme that synthesizes ATP. As we saw, after the electron transport chain, the protons flow into ATP synthase, causing it to rotate, smashing ADP and phosphate together, creating ATP in a process known as chemiosmosis. Chemiosmosis is basically the process where hydrogen ions flow across the semipermeable membrane or ions in general by means of an electrochemical gradient. So that is chemiosmosis. Now E, enolase, this enzyme is used in the ninth step of glycolysis and it creates a molecule, phosphoenolpyruvate, if my memory is working, but it creates an enol functional group. So I'm going to see if I can remember how to draw phosphoenolpyruvate. It looks something like this. It's CH2 with a double bond, and then there's an oxygen and a phosphate group. But this is the enol part of the molecule. An enol is basically an alcohol adjacent to an alkene functional group or a double bond. So you can see the similarities here. So this is called phosphoenolpyruvate. So enolase makes that compound. It, it produces that enol functional group in phosphoenolpyruvate. But this is the answer here. So know that kinase is an enzyme that is capable of transferring a phosphate group. Number 15. Which of the following enzymes is sometimes referred to as complex 2? NADH dehydrogenase is complex 1. Succinate dehydrogenase, that's complex 2. So that enzyme converts succinate into fumarate at the same time reducing FAD into FADH2. Now, BC1 complex, that's complex 3 which is also cytochrome reductase. Cytochrome oxidase is complex four. So the answer for this problem is answer choice B. Number 16, which of the following component events of cellular respiration produces the greatest number of ATP molecules? Would you say it's glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, the Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, or chemiosmosis? Now, glycolysis produces two ATP molecules. Pyruvate oxidation doesn't produce any ATP molecules. It does produce NADH molecules, which eventually becomes ATP molecules. The Krebs cycle produces two ATP molecules per one molecule of glucose. Now, D and E, this one can be argued because technically speaking, the electron transport chain 
doesn't produce any ATP molecules. Keep in mind, the electron transport chain consists of all of the membrane proteins in the inner membrane of the mitochondrial matrix that is involved in transfer, transferring electrons from NADH and FADH2 all the way to oxygen. So during that process, protons are simply pumped into the intermembrane space across the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So this doesn't produce any ATP molecules. Now, during chemiosmosis, when the protons are flowing back through ATP synthase, this is the part that produces ATP. In fact, this is where we get up to 36 ATP molecules as a result of the NADH and the FADH2 releasing the electrons to the electron transport chain. So E is a better answer than D. Now, let's say if this wasn't an option. Sometimes teachers may refer the electron transport chain as everything towards the end. The electron transport chain, ATP synthase, they may group that together. So on a test, if E wasn't an option, then I would pick D. But technically speaking, you don't really produce ATP in the electron transport chain. So E is the better answer. I'm going to go with that because during chemiosmosis, that's when you really get the ATP molecules. Number 17, which of the following component reactions of cellular respiration produces water? Circle each one. Glycolysis produces pyruvate as a product. It produces NADH as a product. And it produces ATP. Glycolysis does not produce water. So we could eliminate that answer. During pyruvate oxidation, pyruvate is converted to acetyl coenzyme A. So that's a product of that process and it also produces NADH. It doesn't produce ATP, not directly. Now, during the Krebs cycle, acetyl, oh wait, let's go back to pyruvate oxidation. CO2 is a product of that step as well. Now, during the Krebs cycle, acetyl coenzyme A is converted to CO2 more NADH is also produced, ATP is produced as well, and in addition to that, FADH2 is produced. So those are the products of the Krebs cycle. Now for the electron transport chain, the only thing that's really produced is water. NADH is converted back into NAD+, so that's a product of the electron transport chain, and FADH2 is also regenerated. During chemiosmosis, ATP is produced. So the answer that we're looking for is the electron transport chain. That's when water is produced. So as the electrons come down from complex four, it reacts with oxygen gas and hydrogen ions in a solution, and it turns into water. Now, this is all happening in the mitochondrial matrix, by the way. Number 18, which of the following component reactions of cellular respiration produces carbon dioxide? Now, based on the last problem, we saw that carbon dioxide is produced during pyruvate oxidation and in the Krebs cycle. During pyruvate oxidation, we start with pyruvate and in a decarboxylation reaction, this is going to convert into acetyl coenzyme A, and carbon dioxide is removed. So we lose one carbon dioxide molecule for every pyruvate molecule. Now, in the Krebs cycle, the acetyl coenzyme A enters into it. 
Now, the two carbon acetyl part of acetyl coenzyme A, that's converted to carbon dioxide. So the Krebs cycle gives us two molecules of carbon dioxide for every acetyl coenzyme A that enters into it. So that's where the CO2 part of the cellular respiration comes from. It comes from pyruvate oxidation and during the Krebs cycle. And then water is produced during the electron transport chain. Number 19, which of the following is not produced during aerobic cellular respiration? Is it carbon dioxide, water, heat energy, ATP, or glucose, C6H12O6? Well, let's begin with the net reaction of cellular respiration. Keep in mind, glucose reacts with six molecules of O2, producing six molecules of carbon dioxide, six molecules of water, and heat energy. So we're looking for what's not produced, what's not a product. Carbon dioxide, that's a product. Water is a product. Heat energy is a product. But what about ATP? Is that a product of cellular respiration? Keep in mind, some of the energy that is produced is not completely wasted as heat energy. Some of it is used to create ATP. So during cellular respiration, ADP with phosphate is converted into ATP. And we said that the maximum theoretical yield is 38 ATP. So this is part of the cellular respiration reaction. So we could say that glucose and oxygen, this is an unbalanced equation, plus phosphate plus ADP becomes carbon dioxide, water, ATP, and heat energy. So ATP is a product of cellular respiration. Glucose is a reactant, so E is the correct answer for this problem. Number 20, identify each statement as true or false. So part A, electrons are donated to the electron transport chain by NADH and FADH2. So that's a true statement. These are electron carriers. They give up the electrons to the electron transport chain. As the electrons flow through the transport chain, they pump, they cause the membrane proteins to pump hydrogen ions to the intermembrane space from the mitochondrial matrix. Now for B, the investment phase of glycolysis yields four ATP molecules per one molecule of glucose. This is true. Keep in mind the payoff phase, we need to put in two ATP molecules. The payoff phase is the first five reactions of glycolysis. In the investment phase, that is the last five reactions of glycolysis, four ATP molecules are generated, giving us a net of two ATP molecules per glucose molecule. Now for C, oxidation refers to a loss of electrons and reduction refers to a gain of electrons. So let's review. Oxidation occurs whenever the oxidation number goes up, whenever there is a loss of electrons, or if there's a gain of oxygen atoms or a loss of hydrogen atoms. So we do have a loss of electrons for C. And for reduction, just to review, excuse me, reduction occurs whenever the oxidation state decreases whenever there is a gain of electrons or a loss of oxygen or gain of hydrogen. So reduction does represent a gain of electrons. Number three is a true statement. D, oxidation refers to a loss of oxygen. That's not true. It refers to a gain of oxygen. So D is a false statement. Now let's move on to E. Cellular respiration 
is a redox reaction. True or false? A redox reaction occurs whenever there is a transfer of electrons. Oxidation refers to a loss of electrons. Reduction refers to a gain of electrons. Both of these, they occur simultaneously. Combined, they are referred to as a redox reaction. And yes, cellular respiration is a redox reaction. The carbon atoms in glucose, they give away the electrons, so they're oxidized. And oxygen, being the final electron acceptor, is reduced when it gains electrons. So this is a redox, a, a redox reaction. F. The Krebs cycle generates six molecules of ATP for every molecule of acetylcoenzyme A. Is that true or false? This is a false statement. An acetylcoenzyme A molecule, it, it represents one turn of the Krebs cycle, and it only produces one ATP molecule per turn, but it produces two ATP molecules per glucose molecule. And here, this is saying six molecules of ATP, so that's not correct. Now, the Krebs cycle produces three molecules of NADH per turn, or six molecules of NADH per glucose molecule. So if this was changed to six molecules of NADH for every molecule of glucose, then it would be true. But right now, it's false. As for G, the Krebs cycle generates two molecules of FADH2 for every molecule of glucose. And that's true. We get one molecule of FADH2 per single turn, but one molecule of glucose represents two turns in the Krebs cycle, so that gives us two FADH2 molecules. Now let's move on to H. In aerobic cellular respiration, glucose is oxidized and oxygen is reduced. True or false? Well, we know that oxygen, as we mentioned before, is the final electron acceptor. And it's gonna be reduced when it receives electrons at the end of the electron transport chain. That's when it converts into water. Glucose is oxidized into carbon dioxide. So this is definitely a true statement. Glucose loses electrons, oxygen gains electrons. So oxygen is reduced, glucose is oxidized. Now for the next one, I, in the first step of the Krebs cycle, oxaloacetate combines with acetylcoenzyme to form citrate. So this is true. And you could look up the Krebs cycle diagram to confirm it. Oxaloacetate is a four carbon molecule. And so when it combines with acetylcoenzyme A, it gets two carbons turning into the six carbon molecule citrate. And then during the Krebs cycle, eventually it's going to go back to four. These two carbon atoms will be converted to carbon dioxide. So going to J, four molecules of CO2 is produced in the Krebs cycle for every molecule of glucose. Is that true or false? So one turn in the Krebs cycle equates to one acetylcoenzyme A molecule. And that's going to give us two molecules of CO2. One glucose molecule gives us two acetylcoenzyme A molecules. So that represents two turns in the Krebs cycle, which gives us four molecules of CO2. So this is a true statement. Now for K, two molecules of CO2 is produced during pyruvate oxidation for every ion of pyruvate. When pyruvate converts into acetylcoenzyme A, it loses only one molecule of CO2. Keep in mind, pyruvate is a three carbon atom, I mean molecule, or ion rather. Acetylcoenzyme A, the acetyl part, has two carbons, so we lose a carbon. So we get one carbon dioxide molecule per pyruvate ion, so this is false. 
but we get two CO2 molecules from glucose. So make sure you understand this. For every molecule of glucose, we gain two molecules of CO2 from pyruvic oxidation and four CO2 molecules from the Krebs cycle. Now this makes sense because the total has to add up to six carbon molecules since glucose has six carbon molecules. And in the net reaction of cellular respiration, the products are six CO2 molecules, six water molecules. So this has to add up to six. So that's basically it for this video. That is a detailed review of cellular respiration. Hopefully you found it to be useful. And if you like this video, don't forget to subscribe. And thanks for watching.